Hello. So up next we have uh, Lee Gillum, who's also being supervised by, uh, we're, we're getting a message from the back that we would like full screen. I think. All right. um, uh, I should mention that Lee is also being supervised by Randy Cutler, and Randy's not able to be here today, but there's a good chance she's online in Berlin right now. Um, and uh, so have her in mind, you can imagine some of the questions she might ask. Um, and the title of uh, Lee's presentation is Between Gesture and Order. So welcome, Lee. Thank you. Just give me a test. Okay, good. So, um, I'm from Montreal. I think I can move. Um, and I started off as a sculptor at Concordia and then went into theater design. So I've been doing theater design before coming here, making puppets and whatnot. Oh, I still have to be able to move this. So, yes. Um, and I've been, I guess, driven by a desire to be somehow a part of storytelling. Um, and yeah, I mean, I have multivalent interests, but um, there's something about being multisensorial um, and having an experience, and having art be experiential. Um, and it's something that is open to inquiry and sparks curiosity. So this is work for Théâtre and Pinet that I was doing at, um, in Montreal before coming here. It's a little bit more experimental, but working within traditional theater, it's a little bit more hierarchical, where the main director is like, the artist, the main artist is the director, and it's and, and they base it a lot on the text. Um, and I guess I felt maybe a little bit alienated within that process, and I was looking for something to be able to relate a bit better. Um, so I wanted to involve myself in a more participatory, collaborative process to feel less of that, and also I guess I was searching for a more sense of vitality, a, a more playful approach to collaboration, um, a way to integrate cultures and differences, things like that. So that brings me to here, and within Emily Carr, um, my methodology has become um, working through contested space, um, negotiating some kind of free flow gesture on the one hand, and um, organization uh, on the other, kind of similar to, to Jay in a way, um, towards new artistic experiential, uh, experimental collaborations to frame the ongoing inquiry of values and structures. So I've been working through um, with, through several projects, uh, which are explorations of negotiation and collaboration through um, the process that questions to which extent organization is really needed um, for the sense of vitality. And I'm exploring thresholds, I guess. So I'm looking into implications of interdisciplinary work. Um, one of the first projects within Emily Carr uh, came about in a sort of playful aimlessness last year during the intensive and um, we were in Laiwan's class, I don't know if anyone met Laiwan here, but for those of you who know her, um, it brought about a kind of spontaneous desire to share some writing that I hadn't shared with anybody in like 10 years um, through a conversation. And um, some collaborative work came about from that kind of spontaneous gesture of sharing that work later in Montreal. And so I'm asking, what is that kind of spontaneous impulse? And I guess I'm looking at John Cage as an example. I mean, here's somebody who was working through non-intention um, and as sort of a spontaneous response. And so Chance determined interview with Frank, Frank Sheffer, uh, this is uh, images from that. Um, basically, uh, Cage uses a machine to determine how long he will talk on 19 questions and then spontaneously responds or improvises his answers. Um, within an allotted time as part of his non-intentional performance practice. And Richard Schechner also interviews Cage, and he says, um, this is earlier, he says, you say that these things should be somehow like everyday life, and yet on hearing you talk or listening to the composition, they're anything but like everyday life. So the action, um, oh, I can do it there too. Um, <laughs> the action, um, the oral effect, the visual effect, becomes unusual and strange. And Cage responds, yes, but I think that um, when non-intention underlies it, even though it is strange and special, and therefore, you know, suitable for celebration, it does relate to everyday life. And I guess it's this sort of relationship to, to life 
this contradiction of how art gets um, staged uh, through non-intention or spontaneous gesture, um, and how it um, makes strange, I guess, um, that intrigues me in relation to my questions on order and organization. So, okay, I'm just going to keep doing that because I don't get that. <laughs> um, this is I Have Fallen, I Must Get Up. This is the collaboration that came from sharing that text when I went back to Montreal. Um, it, the participants in the collaborative process were self-appointed, so it came about, again, through ca casual conversation, um, and we became interested as within the conversation on the subject of marginalized, uh, the marginalized voices of women and the way that women get pathologized. Um, so our work was not um, a direct challenge to theatrical methods exactly, or it wasn't like so much this effort at giving rise to marginalized voices, but it ended up doing that um, because it, we were sort of core creators, so our voices were emerging together in a conversation and a negotiation. Um, and it was kind of an experiment to see what new would come of others of each other. Um, and Lucy Rigoré's discussions of excess, um, excess, not access, but excess, um, and multiplicity with regards to the body were useful as an approach um, in our process. We wanted to be avoiding re repression or a sense of shame. So we were uh, trying to allow ourselves a phen phenomenological embodied opening I guess exploring onto loose ends that don't fit perfectly into something, so not something singular, but um, not something that's complete already, but something that's ongoing, a bit like the way that Jay was talking. Um, and this is a quote, um, she says, um, for although nature of course does not lack energy, it is nonetheless incapable of possessing motive force in itself, of enclosing it in all its total form. Thus fluid is always in a relation of excess or lack vis-a-vis -vis unity, it eludes the thou art that, that this is indefinite uh, identification. Um, you can see examples of the use of multiple voices in these two works. One of them is more of a text-based work. It's, it's something published by Robert Brinkhurst called The Blue Roofs of Japan, but there's something in the design of the text where there's an invisible text behind a main text, so you get the impression that there are different voices speaking at once through the text. And then this next one is by Janet Cardiff and um, George Miller, and it's called um, sorry, in, uh, Score for Interpenetrating Voices. And, you know, there's something about the guided walks of Janet um, Cardiff and George Miller that uh, resonate in terms of multiple voices because you know, often there will be several voices speaking at once, and there's a negotiation within an environment um, so that something new is emerging in listening. And the text for our project, we started thinking of it as well as a score. I mean, it was a score is something that's both set and provisional. So uh, there were different readings of it as a multiplicity of voices emerged from the text. So I requested sort of a non expletive approach when we were reading this text that I had shared. Um, and one that allowed for open projection and departure. We scheduled time for improvising both unplanned shots in this video collaboration and random and a random reading of the of the script of the text. Um, and so they were um, invited to do that. And so sometimes they would cut each other off while they were reading it, or they would speak in unison, or they would use their own um, voices. So. Oh, I don't know how to pause that. Oh well, that's okay. <laughs> we can let that play. Um, I, I was wavering, I guess we were wavering between gesture and organization, and that seems crucial to create agreements. I mean, this goes back to the question of contracts. Like, how do we create agreements that incite actualization? Um, cause, because when too much provision during our creation process led to floundering, suggestions and decisions were made to get organized to be able to feel momentum and stay, or stay energized. Um, this usually meant working together in a direction towards something specific. Um, so respecting delegitimized impulses on the one hand, but moving forward with clarity together in search of energy, stimulation, playfulness, and a sense of completion and celebration. So there's a kind of contradiction. 
Um, and so this the last little clip that I played is, a, is an example of what came about from the shot schedule that, that we created together was also a kind of a score. So we created these image event ideas that were provided by all the participants and we, we decided you know, you know, what we would do first when we were on site. Um, and these, the, like an example of that is um, looking at each other with increasing speed with the aim of avoiding eye contact. And that's what you just experienced there with the eyes moving quickly. Um, and while they were saying that, they were also saying, I am trying to imagine what it feels like to be you, which is part of the text. Um, Gilles Deleuze and um, Guattari, Felix Guattari, um, and their ideas about non hierarchical thinking became important. They were trying to understand how to develop social space through multiple entry and exit points. Um, and it was onto interpretation, so different ways of coming into interpretation, a bit like a rhizome. And so a rhizome has no beginning or end, it is always in the middle, between things. A method of the rhizome type can analyze language only in decentering it onto other dimensions and other registers. So for them, desire is a spontaneous, libidal energy um, and without centralization. So it's a force creating interconnections, openings, and assemblage as Jay was pointing out. And I guess they were attacking what became relevant, especially for the project on I Have Fallen, because it dealt with um, voices of marginalized women, pathologization of women, was that um, he was, they, they were attacking um, Oedipus, um, psychoanalytic psych, 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 concept of the Oedipus complex, and its repressive logic and the idea of desire as lack, vis-a-vis feminine passivity. Um, and so new boundaries are always being put into the matrix according to them. So again, this relates to Irigari's sort of opening onto um, these ends. So some people know that when I came here, I was super fixated on this thing. It's like bed, door, originally it was collections, but it changed to order of things. And I kept thinking about how I could use this as a way of moving through this process, this negotiation between something fixed and something open. And so they were kind of metaphors. So the first one, bed, came to represent um, gesture, so being bodily, um, spontane spontaneity, silence. Um, and then collections, which was order, became order of things, start to represent something more specific in speech. And door represented liminality. So um, yeah, these things became metaphors to organize the conversations and the readings I was doing. So my computer files had these titles, uh, these three titles, and as I was going through the readings, I would collect quotes that, that related to each of these three sort of areas. So they were kind of like, it's like a semiotic set design, I guess. Um, and so um, it was a way to curate the discussion um, and think about my artistic practice. So I was actually printing the quotes off for a while um, and taping them to like my real life things, like, you know, that's my partner. <laughs> These are quotes from bed, and this was my door. So it had quotes from from the door, and, and of course my drawers became the order of things. So um, I guess this design has become a method of integrationist interdisciplinary collaboration. It's a way to approach other kinds of work. Um, and so going back to gesture, I'll just. Um, Giorgio Gambin's discussion on gesture and notes on gesture became useful for me. He connected gesture to the cinema, which he writes is made up of movement and movement within movement. And so for Gambin, the prevention of gesture was crippling um, within culture. So I started to play more in this site bit, and I was thinking of decomposition and passivity and of excess and kind of <coughs> these things that came out of Rigare and um, trying to embody her reflection on exploratory ex ex excessiveness um, within my multiple self, I guess. Um, so, a spontaneous expression using combina combinatory gestural practices, including drawing, abstract painting, pastiche, making videos, um, stop motion, um, and introducing a kind of impulsive freedom to my expression. So, what is order of things. Um, it, I, it may be closer to Jill Deleuze's Difference and Repetition, which was a book that he had written, Difference and Repetition. Um, it, it's not something, 
I guess difference, it's, it's not something because of governed laws, but something that involves difference as lines of escape. So this is, he talks about desire as this, it, it, lines of escape. Um, as a, so repetition for Deleuze is not the same every time, but can only describe a unique series of things or events. Um, and as Foucault puts it in The Order of Things, which is the title of his book, <laughs> um, if language exists, it is because below the level of identities and differences, there is the foundation provided by continuities, resemblances, repetitions, and natural crisscrossings. So he's referring to a hypothetical um, result of the of foundation, and I guess that's, um, I'm providing a, 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 a kind of a hypothetical foundation in this design called bed, door, and order of things. Um, it's like a map, so it, it still manages to structure performance, but it involves both contingency and logos. I'm going to skip through these. I'm a little worried about time, so I'll just... Um, I made a clear, oh no, hold on a second. So, um, Erica Fisher Litch uh, writes about desire of artists to transform non aesthetic liminal, non -aesthetic liminal experiences into aesthetic liminal experiences and vice versa. So, there's a paradoxical goal of making the journey the goal while failing at non intentionality. Um, and so, like Cage and Capro and others, in art history since the 60s. Um, she likens art and life, so she compares performances of Joseph Boys to soccer matches, and she writes about a radical betwixt and between. So what does it mean to be in between? And um, she, she says that being in between requires a trans, uh, it, it, it requires a transfer, of, uh, participants get transferred into almost a, an emotional crisis and it's, it's like the dissolution of the, of the individual because of dissolution of the individual. She writes, um, artists in particular endeavor to, oh, did I miss the, oh, there. Um, artists in particular um, endeavor to cross the borders between art and non-art, between the aesthetic and the non-aesthetic, so as to blur and erase them entirely. They ceaselessly work on creating situations which complicate or render impossible one's ability to view liminal experience itself as the goal. These situations require decision making, which refer to goal oriented actions. At the same time, the aesthetic experience, that is, the experience of liminality as such, regulates and structures the non aesthetic experience of liminality. So, this resonates because I think of myself as working in between practices and cultures, um, spaces in between. Um, so, I, but I do recognize that, that I have goals within it as well. And this work that had been out is written by uh, Rosemary Butcher, who's a choreographer. And she um, had brought, I mean, in the 60s and 70s, she was working a lot in between spaces and interst interstitial spaces, as well as putting dance into galleries. And so there'd be um, a performance going on in different rooms at once, so that when the um, spectators would come through, there would, there would be this kind of negotiation about what was happening in different rooms with divides. Um, so these, uh, this idea of um, working across borders comes into the, in some of these images. Um, and also, I guess, she also didn't want to think about herself as a dancer. She was interested in not really titling what she was doing. And I, I thought that was interesting that she'd be, moving, she'd be working with movement, but she wasn't interested in calling herself a dancer. Um, and Tino Segal is also working to blur boundaries in a different way by um, bringing uh, dance as well into the gallery um, through KISS. It's very intimate um, and there's no documentation of the contract that he makes with the gallery. So he will bring the artist into, this, into the gallery and discuss the, um, the contract that, that he requires witnesses there for so that it's legal, legally bound, but nothing gets written down. So it's only because of the witness that's there that hears the contract between the dancers and, and the institution that, the, that the, these uh, performances happen with, through legal contracts. Um, and thank you so much. Um, Alan Campro um, um, goes uh, talks about blurring of art and life. He says even yesterday's distinctions between art, anti-art, and non-art are pseudo distinctions that simply waste our time. The side of an old building recalls Clifford Still's canvases, the guts of dishwashing machine, double as Duchamp's bottle rack, the voices in a train station are Jackson McLeod's poems, the sounds of eating a luncheonette art by John Cage, etc. 
And so I'll just um, kind of end. I've been working to try and um, combine dance with gesture. So I'll just explain. This is sort of embarrassing, but that's okay. Um, um, basically, the way that it happened is I, my friend, I, the group of people that got together to, to play with dance and speech on, on these two different poles with embed um, door order things um, ended up uh, collapsing because of different reasons. And so I went to this reading while all this was happening. I was kind of stressed out because, you know, the plan didn't work. And um, Laura Broadbent, who's a writer, was reading, um, a, a, she had been doing interviews with dead people. And one of the interviews she had was with um, W. Or w. G. Sebold. And she asked him, um, what is the song or the refrain of history? And so she went through all of his works and collected his voice as an answer and, and organized, reorganized it into a song with a verse. Uh, or, yeah, a refrain, and then read that song with a refrain. So it was a combination of his voice and her voice becoming something. And so I kept imagining dance. So I went to my other friend, um, Katie, and said, do you want to do this with us? Let's go up to the mountain and do this. Let's make this video. And we, we tried. We tried it. Um, so she would, Laura would read, and I, Katie asked me to dance, but she would mirror my movements. I'm not a dancer. So that's how we gathered this footage. I'll just end by saying um, that um, some of my work is both set and provisional. Um, and in a way, performance is what Fish, um, Erica Fisher Litz writes performance can be thought of both as a life itself and as its model. So if articulation matters for organization, and if a model matters to form life or transform life, so does flow and movement uh, between concepts, practices, and entities. So flow within bodies matters, uh, negotiation towards a sense of mentality matters, um, uh, breathing and space for breath matter, um, co-creation, participation, readiness, and respect matter. Uh, difference matters, allowing for compatibility matters, commitment matters. My work um, is now to continue into the future with these questions and openness to continue my research uh, to see what new can come of it. maybe a little side thing that you've done, but um, I just wanted to say that it was very compelling. And I don't know if you've explored this much or if this was just a quick you know, mm -hmm. moment for you, but I would like to hear more about it. And I know, I don't know, it's just something that has been, I want to know more. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, actually at one point um, in a conversation with Althea, in my very first, uh, you know, last year of first intensive, uh, Althea was one, uh, one of our first teachers, and she was blowing my mind, and so I was getting really into this conversation with her about what I was up to with this like obsession over this like three-part metaphorical set, semiotic set or whatever, and she kept saying, just build it, build a huge it, build a huge version of it, and everything that you're reading, put it in there. And so it became this sort of conversation about like, that's so great, that's like what I want to do, and you know, I want to take these 
uh, new concepts and everything that I'm learning and put it in a tactile, real space. So, okay, as you talk about it, I think more about the images and the video that you presented. What I guess is occurring to me is methodology is so much a part, it's like very much a beating heart to your practice, it seems, as, as you articulated in the presentation. And I think before, when I've seen some of the end products of the methodology, I didn't get to see the methodology. I just saw the end result. But here, I'm seeing the methodology a bit. Good. You know? So there's something about that where I'm like, OK, I can see how this methodology is coming together. And I don't know, there's something about it that, um, and I think maybe because it's also your position being in school and being really self-reflexive about that position as an artist, but also an art student, at the same time that it's providing something a little different. And I mean, we've talked about in class, um, someone like Rainier Ganahl, who his art practice is teaching himself foreign languages. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's something about this strain of artistic production that I'm seeing also a little bit at work in what you're doing. But you're also bringing it into space and domestic architecture. So it's drawing from your past as you know, working with theater, but it's doing something different that I haven't seen yet. So anyway, I just want to encourage you to keep exploring in that regard if you want. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just want to maybe expand on that a little bit. And, and I, I see it also, I also see this as there's a tension or there's a, I find that some, that you yourself kind of enact like a mass of ideas, which is I think is really fantastic, and there's a there's a tension that I find really fascinating between words and text and ideas and and images. And some of the stuff you showed, I haven't seen it before, but it was like there's a stillness to it. But in this this one here, I feel like there is that tension that I um, the tension is there between this mass of ideas um, and all these thoughts behind things, and then. The stillness that's that in other parts of your life that comes through in, in some other work, but at least that tension is more there if that makes any sense. So Sorry, I, I kind of don't understand the last part. The tension is there in this one. Well, I see the words. Some of them are like it's just really simple. Like it says, uh, "Explore it approaches a monster," which I really like. Oh. But but in this one, there's that stillness as well, and right. uh, uh, there's the words are there as well. It's almost like you're more conscious of that, of mm -hmm. that how those things play against each other. Something like that, and yeah. unless it's less balanced, in a really, in a really uh, fascinating way to me. Okay, it almost feels like the stillness is representative of the oh, what is it? You're 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 working between organization and more of a free flow, mm -hmm. and it almost feels like the stillness is representative of the free flow. Mm -hmm. You know, where you would think that it would be the other way yeah. around. So see, that's yeah. th that's something that you really sense from seeing this. Work this document. We've all noticed or noted a, um, a real richness to the methodology, as uh, Christine pointed out. There's a lot of high level concepts you're presenting here really quickly. It seems like you've got fluency with the day, day, day. Uh, the Elizabeth Howdy, for example. Um, it made me think about uh, the word praxis as opposed to practice. And I was, I was suddenly thinking, maybe this is partly the way the work is, the thesis work has begun to develop, um, because it's a manifestation of some of these concepts that, you're, that are clearly very inspiring for you. And I think to me what, then, what this invokes is a question about how it's manifested. Um, and so that these ideas of stillness representing the, the free flow. So this was my question for you a little bit because I felt while well, during the presentation I really knew, I learned a lot about, or more about, what it's about. Mm -hmm. But I was sort of left kind of really wanting to know more about what it is mm -hmm. um, in terms of a form. So I have a very simple question, for example, about uh, the video. Um, is this a work that stands on its own? Or is it an example, is it a, is it a, a sort of an iterative Example product that's on its way to uh, a different form, a different manifestation in a space like this. I'm, I'm curious about the actual manifestation. Yeah, I mean, there's something that comes up a lot for me, and that it's kind of like something poetic that I think about a lot. I keep going back to it. It's just called through lines, 
um, through lines. It could be so many different things. But I mean, I'm thinking about the video and about capturing moments, time, just such a sensitive uh, way to approach being with other people. Um, and I'm thinking of it in terms, it's kind of like any kind of documentation of something that's in process that is in a, in a negotiation. Um, and with, like a little bit like the way, the way that Jay was talking, what does it mean to remove something from a space that it's in and where it has certain meanings in relation to other things and put it somewhere else. Um, and so I have, I'm always thinking about the people who have kind of entered in this almost unspoken, well, they are kind of spoken contracts as well, but you know, maybe how do I consider that when I'm making my art craft, my artwork? So, you know, I wouldn't necessarily just want to take the images that I've captured on film and then just do whatever I want with them. You know, I, I would have to consider what does it mean to take our experience and and make it go through into another place. And so I've been, so it's unresolved in a way right now for me. I mean, it's here, and I, you know, we've talked about it, the collaborators and I, that I'm going to do this thing and I'm going to show these images, um, and that's. There's, it's, it exists as raw material still right now for us, and we're still, I don't know, maybe something, I, we thought about putting these films into film festivals and things like that, or making them into performances where they can be projected. Um, and in live performance, we talked about um, different iterations of how they could go through somewhere else. But it's not resolved, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, I think then my suggestion would be that it, Christina mentioned how uh, the final manifestation then can become a window to the methodology that brought the piece to that form. Mm -hmm. And I think it seems then that connection becomes really important to measure that carefully. Which, which manifestations to uh, convey the, the richness of that, that mm -hmm. Is there a final question? Well, I was just gonna follow up. I think what we're all sort of saying is the methodology is the art. It's not the end product. So when you show us the end product without knowing about the methodology, actually, I have to say it's sort of, I don't know how to deal with it as a viewer. But when I look at the methodology, I get really excited. Just Wait, where's the end product? Like if you just show the end product as a video. I don't it's know. It's not the end product. Okay, good, good. I just want to make that clear yeah. because it seemed like as you were talking, that's what it was. No. Yeah. But so what I'm saying is the vibrancy of what you're doing is the process and the methodology. So I almost feel like instead of being a, you know, producing something, I feel like record or document or somehow articulate the methodology. So this is why this image was so strong for me because I saw it immediately. Or you know, like one thing I can imagine. I think you and I were talking about Schwinger and Mose, the the duo and their Swiss. Um, and they had, they worked with the theater troupe, or maybe yeah, I touched yeah. to them, like, um, about the Vietnam War, and they have a theater in the round, mm -hmm. and the like, actors keep moving in between the parts, and so what's amazing about it is there isn't an end play, it's the whole process of the actors moving in between the roles. And so I think what's going on here is when I know about the methodology and what's happening, that's all I want to see. I just want to see people talking about negotiating and trying to do the thing that they're trying to do, if that makes sense. Because that's the exciting part. Because you have a lot invested in it, your collaborators have a lot invested in it, and you see that dynamic of that you know, negotiation. Okay, so we'll have a chance to continue this discussion uh, from here on. And I, I really encourage everybody to take notes and um, uh, questions even if you don't have an opportunity to ask one and hand them off to the speakers uh, at the end of the day if you would as a way to continue the feedback loops because there's a lot of learning that can happen after uh, after we're done today. So thank you very much. Thanks. Take a few minutes to switch over.